Hello, testing. Can you hear me? Hey, fantastic. Oh, light as well. You can see me as well. Great. Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Colin Humphreys. I am CTO for Cloud at Pivotal. I apologize for the delay. The problem we were having was we were trying to get on the Wi-Fi on my laptop. And as you can tell, I'm English. Um, and we didn't have a number of the special characters to join the Wi-Fi. So we didn't have the I with the two dots on top. So we were trying to get on. We had a few problems. Um, unfortunately, we may have to cut the, uh, cut the very brief demo out of this. Um, it wasn't very exciting anyway, just because I couldn't get on the Wi-Fi. Um, that's OK. So we're here to talk about creating the cloud-native learning organization and what that means. So for those of you that haven't met me before, as I said, I'm uh, Colin Humphreys. I'm well known for coming out with sound bites and interesting things at talks, which is why the pivotal public relations people send me around to a lot of conferences, because I say controversial things. Uh, one of the things I said is that Cloud Foundry is not exciting. What's exciting is what you can do with Cloud Foundry. So quick show of hands. I can't really see you, but who's heard of Cloud Foundry here? A few people. Thank you for the lights. That's great. Um, so I, I, yeah, I did say this. Uh, you may notice that this is attributed to my name, but the gentleman behind me, this is actually Colin Humphreys. This is Colin Humphreys, Professor of Metallurgy at Cambridge University in England. This is not me, but all of my quotes get attributed to him for reasons I don't understand. So thank you, Colin. Um, the scary thing about this is that the link down the bottom here, as you can see, there's over 90,000 Colin Humphreys is out there. So there's like a robot army of Colin Humphreys are coming to kill you in the very near future. Be worried about that. Um, but I'm not actually here to talk about me. I'm here to talk about learning. Now, why am I going to talk about learning? Because in my opinion, software development is about learning. It's about learning about your users, about learning about your, your market, learning about your customers. But why do I think that? Why am I so fixated on learning? So we're going to have a quick detour. I'm going to talk about methodology. So three methodologies I want to talk to you about very, very briefly. Agile, Lean, and Six Sigma. I like a bit of audience participation. Who in the room thinks they're doing Agile? Oh, quite a few people. Who's doing Lean? A couple of people. Is anyone doing Six Sigma? Some people, a few kind of curious looking folks. OK. So I don't think these actually exist independently of each other. I think they actually represent more of a spectrum. So Agile. The key metric is responsiveness to change. How fast can you change direction? With Lean, the key metric is cycle time. With Six Sigma, the key metric is deviation. So very few hands went up uh, uh, about Six Sigma. For those of you that haven't used it, it's about trying to make the next unit you produce 99.9999% like the last one you produced. So trying to have six sigmas of confidence that the next one will be identical to the last one. So it's a lot about kind of mass production, building lots and lots of things. And I think these represent a spectrum, as I said. I think if you're focused on learning, you tend to be more towards the agile side. So if you're learning about your users, if you have high uncertainty, you're more on the agile side. If you're looking for efficiency, you tend to be focused more on the six sigma side. So the example I'd like to give you here is one of cooking. Sounds a bit strange. Please allow me to clarify. If you are baking a cake, you probably want to make one of them and find out whether or not you like the taste of that cake. Okay? And then if you don't like it, you'll change the ingredients and bake another one. Makes sense. So this kind of leads us towards the agile side, because we're learning about what we're building. We're experimenting with recipes. If you go into McDonald's and you order a Big Mac, you probably don't want the person that cooks that Big Mac experimenting with the recipe. You probably want to have a Big Mac that's exactly like the last one you ate and the last one that you ate. So 
lends itself more towards Six Sigma. Now, I think if you're developing software, it's very easy to mass produce software because you have a copy command on your laptop that can mass produce software incredibly quickly. So if we're developing software, we tend to be focused more towards the agile and lean end of the spectrum. So if we're developing software, we're focusing on learning, focusing on learning about our customers. So let's get back on track. Now we know we're focused on learning. This has been recognized across the industry. So this quote, everyone must be able to experiment, learn, and iterate. This is back from 2006, over 10 years ago, from an Amazon blog. Um, I believe Amazon have been reasonably successful since then. So you know, this, this is a, 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 a well-proven kind of ethos. Everyone must be able to run experiments and to learn. But asking a very metaphysical question, how do we learn? So when I was at school, I learned by scientific method. Another show of hands, who's heard of scientific method? Quite a few of you, great. Uh, I'm going to cover this in a very small amount of detail. So this slide gives you an idea of scientific method. We have a theory, something we think is going to be true, make a prediction based upon that theory, something that's going to happen. We then run the experiment to actually put the theory into practice. We then observe the results. So when I was at school, I had a theory. My theory was that thermite reactions are fun. If any of you have played with thermite, you'll know they're fun. Um, and my prediction was, if I lit a thermite reaction in my science class, everyone would think I was super cool. So my experiment was to light a thermite reaction on the desk in my science class. Uh, and I observed that I was uh, suspended from school for burning a hole in one of the desks. That wasn't quite what I intended to have happen. But that was something I learned via this method. Now, I did a little research on this. I found that we as humans have been acquiring and validating knowledge in this way for as long as we've had civilization. There's evidence of this being used in ancient Egypt. And recently I've noticed that this is absolutely everywhere. So this is uh, the cycle from a famous book called Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Who's read Lean Startup? I think we're getting audience fatigue now. People aren't putting their hands up. But thank you for those that have. Um, there's a, a, a book along similar lines called Four Steps to the Epiphany. These are really changing how we do uh, product management. The idea being that you have an idea, you build that out via some code, you, uh, you measure whether or not your customers like what you're building, very sensible, by looking at the data, you learn something, you form a conclusion, and you have some new ideas. Uh, and you know, the book correctly states, the faster you can go through these cycles, the faster you can learn, the more successful you will be. Another one here, the OODA loop, observe, orientate, decide, act. Uh, a gentleman called uh, John Boyd uh, came out with this idea. John Boyd was uh, an F-86 Sabre fighter pilot in the Korean War. He was effectively trying to work out why the American pilots were regularly losing battles to uh, what effectively were Russian pilots fighting on the Korea side, um, why they were losing those battles, given they had a vastly superior in all ways fighter. And it turned out the reason why they were losing these dogfights was because the Russian plane could turn faster. In that aspect, it was superior. So this is all about being able to observe what's going on and change direction quickly. So you can see how that has a direct correlation to some of the things we think about agile, being able to change direction quickly brings success. So my... Uh, my favorite, personal favorite, uh, learning cycle is this one. This is the Deming cycle. Plan, do, check, act. 
you notice how these are all very similar implementations of scientific method. So Deming was a fascinating person. He, uh, he took the development or the, the building of B-29 bombers in the Second World War, he took it from being multiple weeks per bomber to delivering multiple bombers per day based around testing out hypotheses in the way that they were built. So he's kind of known as very famous uh, 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 for those reasons. He, um, he interestingly enough, uh, was effectively shunned by the Americans um, after World War II uh, because you know, he'd done his great work. He then went over to Japan and helped out with their manufacturing and helped the Japanese uh, uh, car industry uh, destroy the American car industry uh, because it was so successful. So a lot of the ideas in kind of Toyota manufacturing come from uh, Deming's ideas. Oh, I realize you uh, probably came here for kind of a tech talk, and I've turned this into a history lesson. You know, I apologize for that. There's going to be more history as we go on. So uh, the thing to notice from all of these, from Lean Startup, Four Steps to the Epiphany, Deming Cycles, all the stuff I'm talking about here, the key aspect is that the faster you can test out ideas, the faster you can go through these cycles, the more successful your company will be, because you will learn what works, you will learn what doesn't work, you learn what users like, you learn what your users don't like. You know, and that's really, really important. And to illustrate why that's so important, have you ever noticed how on your phone, the apps that update most frequently are from the most successful companies. Now, correlation is not causation, but those companies are learning faster, which breeds success. And if you want Colin's top tip to get rich quick, go and find a market area, a segment, where nobody's learning and nobody's iterating. Establish in that area and outlearn the other companies, and you'll beat them. So this is all very theoretical. I appreciate that, um, and largely historical. So how do we actually put this into practice? How do we, as Pivotal, actually make this work for our customers? So I like to do an exercise called value stream mapping. Some of you may have done this. This is a lean technique. Take what you're building, so have an idea, and think about the activities you have to undertake to go from idea to delivery. So we work with our customers and we do this ourselves. We plot the activities going across from idea to delivery. We do this with post-it notes generally, stick them on a wall, put timings against them. It's great to work out your cycle time doing this. So for the things we typically do, we'll do some kind of, you know, take the idea, break it down into stories, well then, obviously we love XP at Pivotal, so we'll do some test-driven development and pair programming to bring those stories to life. You commit our code into a continuous integration system. Deploy our code to Cloud Foundry. I say for those of you that haven't heard of it, it's a, a platform as a service, so you can write code, push your code, and it works. And then it's delivered. So once you've done this and you've mapped out how do you go from idea to reality, then think, how do I look at some data to work out whether or not the feature that I've built is good or bad? How do I get feedback? So what's quite interesting about doing this when you talk to companies about it, about how do they go to delivery, is quite a lot of companies actually never look at any data. They never actually work out whether or not the things they're delivering are good or bad. But think about that. How do we get some feedback? And then think, well, who actually listens to that feedback? How do you engage back with the people having the ideas such that they can have a new idea based upon the knowledge they've gained from the first delivery? Because if you take this, you do the value stream mapping, you think about the data and get the feedback, you feedback that data to people making decisions, and they have a new idea, you've created a learning loop. So this looks like, up against the Deming cycle, 
We can map all the things we've just said. Our stories, test-driven development, pairing CI Cloud Foundry on the do side. We check with our data, and we engage the business to, uh, to think about having a new idea. OK, so uh, I realize um, I can't quite see you, but a lot of you are probably thinking, this is blindingly obvious, Colin. Why are you even telling us this? This is so obvious, so simple, so straightforward. Surely everybody's doing this. Well, I'd, I'd hope that's true. And if you are doing this, that's fantastic. Uh, I personally worked on a project that was, uh, had a three-year-long Gantt chart to deliver, was 12 million pounds. So that's about 50 euros nowadays, I think. Okay, I will be doing more Brexit jokes, so come on, keep up. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, that's not a lot of money, but it was then. It was lots of money back in those days. So we took three years and 12 million pounds to go from somebody having a, a, an idea about uh, delivering some insurance software. You know, we, built, we bought some land. We uh, built a data center on that land. We put servers in there. Uh, we put operating systems on there. We put um, application servers, database servers on there. We, uh, we wrote lots of software, obviously. We had everything... Uh, planned out minutely, and we hit our three-year deadline. And then after three years and all this money, uh, the users absolutely hated what we built. Nobody used it. The servers were reconditioned to be an exchange farm. And a lot of people lost their jobs. So that was a huge amount of waste based upon a massive batch. Now, the part of this that I think is interesting <laughs> is that the reaction of that company was not to say, oh, whoops, let's do it faster next time, let's execute faster. They actually said what you should do is plan more, you should design more, next time we'll do it in five years, and then we'll get it right. Because people get very scared you know, when they have those kind of failures. So I think our role is to help people go through these loops faster, because if you succeed, that's great, but it's about having a faster iteration so that if you can work out what you're not doing, you don't waste three years of your life. So where does this go wrong? What are the anti-patterns that we see? Why does this not happen? Because you all look at me like this is blindingly obvious. Surely everybody's doing these fast iterative cycles. So what happens if you don't complete the loop? So part of what I see a lot at the moment. Lots of uh, companies doing this. An anti-pattern called water scrum fall. So I see development teams who are doing lots of very agile stuff. We all like to be agile, lots of hands went up. So you know, they're doing story mapping, they've got lots of post-it notes, um, maybe doing a bit of lean, they've got Kanban boards, this is great. They've got CI systems, this is awesome. You know, they're probably doing some test-driven development, uh, some pair programming, it, everything's wonderful. Um, so what they do, they commit code. The code then runs, uh, you know, on the CI system is tested. That CI system puts it out to integration environment. Everything runs. That's fantastic. Why don't we put it to production and show it to some customers? Oh, the production environment's not going to be ready for a, another two years. We've just bought the land. We're building the data center. Or we're building a, uh, 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 we're building a huge uh, platform of the future. You're going to have to give us a few years before we go into production. Now, <clears throat> you'll hear at this conference, I'm sure you've heard lots of people talking about platform-shaped things and lots of the cool things happening in modern infrastructure. So you're probably thinking, isn't that the bad old days, Colin? Surely nowadays we're pushing at least a million times a second because this is the cool new future. I'm not sure that's true. What I think does happen uh, is people with modern tooling still spend a long time building out platforms. So uh, I'm going to give examples of that. This is a talk I went to recently. This was at Jax London. This gentleman gave a fantastic talk on Kubernetes. Now, I'm not calling out Kubernetes here. I love Kubernetes. Great technology. I'm not going to pick on Kubernetes or Mesos or anything else that's a, a, a container scheduler. But I went to see this talk. Basically, it was how you can take a year to build a production platform using a container scheduler. So I'm not sure that's necessarily the right way forward. Another one here. One year using Kubernetes in production, lessons learned. This again, 
a, a one-year time frame to take a, uh, you know, a scheduler and turn it into a production platform. So I think you know, these are some of the latest tools. And again, I'll be very clear here, I'm not picking on K8s. I love Kubernetes. This is true of a lot of things at the same abstraction layer. But we still waste a lot of time building production platforms you know, and delaying that delivery to production. So what's missing from things like this? Well, I have a slide here. This uh, is a colleague of mine. This is Bridget. She's fantastic. If you ever get the chance to see her speak, I recommend you do so. Uh, this is also very meta, because you see she's presenting to a group of people, and then I'm presenting her presenting. So if any of you want to get a photo of me pointing at her, and then we can, like, someone else from Pivotal can show that, and then we can keep going back in terms of layers. Um, so Bridget here is talking about the things you need to run production code, what a platform needs. You know, routing and load balancing, log aggregation, backing services brokers, infrastructure orchestration, health management, a whole ton of stuff that you have to add on to a lot of the uh, schedulers uh, we see at the moment. So, what I am saying is, if you're building all these things yourself, you need to stop wasting your time. Because we're building the same platforms again and again and again. And what I want to posit, where I'm completely biased here, is that if you are building these things again and again and again, come work with us on Cloud Foundry. Okay? This, these production-grade platforms, this is what we're building. Now, this is where things in my talk start to fall apart. Uh, here is where I would you know, show you the amazing Cloud Foundry journey where I write some code and I push it in a demo. However, <laughs> uh, due to my keyboard being a UK keyboard, I don't have any Wi-Fi access. Uh, the cloud is wonderful if you can get to it. It's, it's not so good when you can't. Uh, I do have Cloud Foundry running on my local laptop, but I haven't set up my local DNS server. So uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have to skip a demo. If you can imagine what happens here, because it doesn't require much imagination, I would stand in front of you, I would type in some code, I'd write some very bad Ruby for you, because I'm a terrible developer, and then I would type CF push, and I would hit enter. And then Cloud Foundry will take my code, it will recognize that it is Ruby, it will compile it into something called a droplet that is ready to run and be scaled, and it will then run that code inside of a container and I love containers. It will then enable me to route production traffic to it. It does that automatically. It gives me logs automatically. It enables me to scale up and scale down, either via an autoscaler or whenever I demand, to bring in backing services behind that if I want to bring in databases. All of these things. And there are many cloud foundries out there from various different providers, not just Pivotal. So all the things that would take you know, a year to build yourself, if not more, are there ready to use. But we're going to have to imagine that demo, so I apologize for that. Now, <coughs> I think that stuff's pretty awesome. I'm going to give you a very quick example of something we built using Cloud Foundry. This is a Cloud Foundry success story. Um, so this is about one of the UK's largest charities called Comic Relief. Comic Relief has been a huge Cloud Foundry success story. Uh, it's interesting, Comic Relief, because what happens, uh, they, they have a, a once a year kind of uh, donations night when they ask people to donate. And at the absolute peak of donations from people donating on their credit cards, they do approximately the same number of transactions per second on their credit cards as the rest of the UK economy combined. Now, I realize that sounded far more impressive before Brexit, because the UK economy is basically disappearing. But it's quite an impressive uh, uh, set of numbers. Um, this takes, if you can see here, uh, uh, 75 million pounds in about a six-hour period. It's fairly impressive. What's interesting about this as well is this was taken from being uh, a platform delivered by 50 people that had never worked and delivered every single donation to being a platform delivered by five people that has taken every single donation without outage for the past four years. And that went from being a Java Oracle stack to being 
simple applications CF pushed to Cloud Foundry. So that's a fairly big change. If you're uh, an architect, and we all love being architects, this is the architecture. It ran active, active, active across AWS, uh, EU, AWS US, and a VMware provider, so completely different infrastructure uh, in the UK. And it was active across all three. So Cloud Foundry runs this up to a huge scale. It can run, each one of these was a separate Cloud Foundry. The same code runs in all of them. Uh, a Cloud Foundry can scale up to about half a million containers, is as far as we've tested it. So we can run half a million application instances in each one. What's particularly nice about this is not actually the architecture. What's nice about it is building all of this infrastructure in terms of platform and all of the applications, the 27 microservices that comprise all of this, took five people four months. And like I said, at peak rivals the rest of the UK economy. So I think it's those metrics in terms of automation and in terms of uh, lowering the work you have to do to get truly awesome things built that are you know, really good. I think the, uh, the most staggering thing about this, it's back to the article, is, is not what's it's been built, but you'll notice this article was written by me. I was involved in this, and if I can do it, anyone can do it. And not only that, this article was written in 2013 about work that was done in 2012. This is four years old. It's been running for the last four years. This is not brand new stuff. The people showing you the latest you know, new technology hotness. Four years this has been running. So what are the patterns to doing this? How do we make this happen? So recommend, if you can, deploy on day one. Getting your code to production should not block your flow. So uh, I think if you have a platform like Cloud Foundry, you can CF push day one, you can get real user feedback. So let's say we've got that. Our story doesn't end here. I am going to be controversial. I'm going to call out continuous delivery as an anti-pattern. Now, I love continuous delivery. I keep saying I love things, but I do love continuous delivery. Unfortunately, it's not the end of the story. Okay? You, if you are continuously, continuously delivering, it gives you this kind of uh, a, a, a cannon with which to fire out feature after feature after feature. So many features. Okay, but what you need to be doing is if you just fire out the features and you never check the data, how do you know if you're making your, uh, your services better? So when you see feature explosion on websites, so many things that can do so many things, it's somebody who's not looking at their data. But I think we can now very easily, uh, uh, you know, via continuous delivery, push out new things. We can push out new services. So what we need to do is check our data. And when we start bringing in the data, we move to microservices, small focused services. So I think the move to microservices is good. I'm a, one of those people. <laughs> because I think humans can't solve big problems. We need to solve small problems. We need to divide and conquer. So we can do that if we break things down to lots of smaller things. So this is, again, why I think you need a platform to deliver your code. Because if you move to microservices and you decompose a monolith, as we did with Comic Relief, from one big app to 27 small apps. If you don't have a platform, you have 27 deployment problems. You have 27 stacks to look after. That's kind of painful. So let's talk about how we do this. Um, I'm now going to go on an implementation detour. Uh, and because I am uh, tremendously lazy, I'm going to give you the lazy person's guide to cloud-native microservices. Um, I'm sure there's some of you in here who are absolute experts on microservices and are going to take issue with everything I say, and that's okay. Because for the rest of you, I hope you'll like this and hope you'll be as lazy as me. So let's say we've got our cloud native platform, we've got Cloud Foundry. What happens next? People will tell you to read a book by Eric Evans called Domain Driven Design. This is a fantastic book, very well considered. Um, I read the first couple of chapters and then I got bored and I flicked read the rest. So, I recommend what you do 
Don't do that. Be lazy like me. Um, divide by reason to change. So let your microservices emerge. So start small, and then when you find yourself changing a part of the code base for a particular reason, and you find it changes together, split that out into a different microservice. So you can let your microservices almost emerge by themselves by listening and learning as to the way you're developing. So you'll see things, oh, we need to do this thing with users, this thing with users, this thing with users. Users might well become a microservices. We just keep changing billing, change billing for this reason, billing for this reason. Billing might become a microservice. So you don't have to do everything up front. You can let your microservices emerge. Next up, 12 factor applications. This is a set of patterns from the wonderful people at Heroku. OK? These are effectively the commandments for being cloud native. Thou shalt do these 12 things. But as I said, I'm lazy. Why do 12 things when you can do one thing? So let's not do 12. Let's do one factor application. The key pattern from 12 factors to make your application cloud native, the absolute key is that you do not store state on the local disk. So that one is the one to really obey. Okay? Use brokered services outside of your platform. If you don't do anything else, do this one. So you can now all claim to be cloud natives because I told you that one pattern. There are lots of great value in the other patterns, but that one is the one to listen to. You'll also hear about Netflix patterns. So Netflix have been championing uh, a set of um, fantastic um, patterns for enabling cloud-native delivery, client-side load balancing, distributed config management, circuit breakers, service discoveries, API gateways, all these kind of things. These are all fantastic. Um, we actually package these together, and these are available as something called Spring Cloud Services. So these are really useful. But as I said, you don't want to do all these at once. The, the one you want to pick is circuit breakers. I think they're the key pattern. Um, Mike Nygaard popularized these in a book called Release It. These make your, uh, your application, your small services, resilient to failure. So the idea with a circuit breaker is that if your application, your service, is consuming other services and they go offline, it will break the circuit to the other service. So what this means is if you've got a, uh, a Java web server and it's calling out to external services over HTTP, if one of the external services goes offline, it will notice that and it will stop calling out for a short period of time to that service and try again. It will break the circuit. And what this means is your Java web server, which in the past will have just occupied all its threads trying to call out to a service that's not there, will have taken your site offline. That doesn't happen anymore. If the remote service is being denial of service, by lots of things hitting it, it means you let it recover because you aren't hitting it for that period of time your circuit breaks. This also means for that period of time, you make your application that has broken the circuit to the external service, you make it um, do the right thing as best it can in the absence of the other service. So if it's billing, maybe while billing's offline, you don't take billing. You just say to the user, I'm sorry, we can't do that right now. Please come back in a bit. So isolating your application by all these uh, uh, small services that have circuit breakers makes your application resilient, okay? and it can survive failures. And these make your services operable. So please do have a look at circuit breakers. Okay, Let's get back on track. That's the end of my uh, lazy guide to cloud-native microservices. So if we do that, Back to our learning cycle. We're now planning, we're doing, we're checking. But if we're in the land of microservices, one of the main problems that I see and why I can see microservices becoming an anti-pattern is that you end up with all these small services, with teams working on each small service, but you lose track of the broader goal of what you're trying to achieve. So the example I've seen with this is where uh, you have a, a front-end team, and their metric 
they're looking at the data here and seeing how many users do we get on the site. We're targeted for maximum number of users on the site. Brilliant. So you take your small website, and then you decide to put uh, some clickbait about the Cardassians or something else that's popular on your site, and you get lots more users. So you just start putting on lots and lots of things that are very interesting, but make you no money, because you're getting tons and tons of users. The so next thing you know, you're consuming terabytes of bandwidth, but you're not making any money. But your data is telling you you're doing a great job. This is fantastic. Because you're focused on the micro and not looking at the bigger picture. So I think if you're going to do microservices, you do need to stay uh, have a tight interaction between the teams that are building them and the business itself. So I think if you bring the whole cycle together, you find the constraint in that cycle, that's why, or that's when you will become truly DevOps, because you're bringing development operations. And I think DevOps needs to become DevBizOps or something for all the teams that are involved. So. Um, there's a book called The Phoenix Project, you should definitely read. Uh, that's a rewrite of a book called The Goal by Goldratt, um, which is a fantastic book about looking at entire systems. And I want to reclaim the word DevOps to not mean configuration management or containers, and to mean looking at systems and finding the constraint. So that's a lot of opinions from me. Uh, why should you listen to me? It's a good question. My judgment has been questioned before. Uh, you lose a lot of credibility saying things like this, which somebody said about me. Um, I, th I think the joke's really on them because I never had any credibility. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I've been accused of being blatantly misinforming. It's a bit unkind, isn't it? Someone from uh, Mesosphere. And my particular favorite, criticizing me, is this one. Uh, you're so simple. Um, so this is an English grammar joke, by the way, because I responded to this with, what about my so simple? I realize that doesn't work so well with a, <laughs> a French audience. But yeah, I, I, I have been, um, you know, people have taken issue with the things that I've said, which is absolutely fine. Uh, please feel free to do so. But what I'm really asking you to do here, I'm asking you to empathize with the business. I don't know if you've tried to run a business. I ran a business. It was difficult. I'm asking you to empathize with the business to learn about their customers. Because I've also spent a lot of my career as a developer. As a developer, we have this cycle, red, green, refactor. So we can write a test that's failing. We can uh, make that test pass, go green, and we can then refactor our code. So a good friend of mine talks about this, saying that uh, you write your tests drunk and your code sober, because if you have a good test suite from which you can get fast feedback, you don't have to write great code. Your tests tell you when it's working. And this gives us as developers a really high degree of confidence in what we're writing. So this is great for developers. But then if you're a business person, you don't have this. If you're a business person, you have this. Now, for those of you that haven't seen one of these before, this is a Gantt chart. To give you a guide to it, it starts kind of at the top left with unreasonable demands. And it ends at the bottom right with everyone losing their jobs. Okay? So now you know Gantt charts. Um, so, I, I, you know, I object to this in software development. Um, I want to help people. I want to transform this. So what am I doing to change this? But I don't want to see um, a Gantt chart. I want to see a series of learning cycles. <coughs> I want to see products and learning rather than projects and deadlines. The one that's particularly interesting, I want to see big companies become like venture capitalists, investing in a series of small products. And the ones that don't succeed, based on feedback, take those people, put them onto the ones that are succeeding. So I find it really strange when uh, when I talk to uh, like kind of C-level executives of big companies, and they often sound so fearful, so scared about being disrupted by startups. And to succeed, I think you need great people, you need some money to make things happen, and you need customers. And the really strange thing is, if you think about it, enterprises have got all of those three. 
The startups don't have any. They're tiny companies, they have no people, they have no money, and they have no customers. So why are enterprises scared of startups? So I think uh, the bigger companies need to become venture capitalists. And we're hoping to, hoping to power that at Pivotal. So we are creating this learning loop. So we have Pivotal Labs, it's about agile development, planning, helping people break down big ideas into small, testable hypotheses. We have Pivotal Cloud Foundry, which is that platform, which you imagined earlier on when my demo <laughs> failed, um, which gives you a, a single command for deployment so you can get things delivered fast. We have Pivotal Big Data Suite, giving you that data that can drive your decisions. You know, and then we help people work with the business to actually take the right actions. So, <clears throat> yeah, this is automation day. Um, talking about you know, what happens when you automate. And I think you can learn when you automate. I think it's all about organizational learning. And we at Pivotal, as you can see, we are building the operating system for organizational learning. And I think that's a great quote. I think that's such a good quote. I'm going to attribute it to uh, Colin Humphreys, Professor of Metallurgy, Cambridge University. Uh, so thank you all very much for listening. That's the end of my talk. Thank you for coming. <laughs>